Okay, so yeah, sorry. Uh, generalization and neural networks. So as I, your linear models, you'll have seen linear models in various courses. What we're gonna use them here is a sort of foundation for where we're gonna go with neural networks. And as we said last time, the way we're trying to teach this course is give you the sort of context that you won't find if you do some other courses on, you know, if you just try and read medium posts or whatever about what's going on and why there's a new phenomenon. And one we've chosen for these first three lectures to focus on three of the major phenomena that I've sort of driven the revolution in neural networks. So today it's um, an aspect that we don't fully understand, I'd say, although I think we have a good idea or a better idea of what's going on. Uh, next time for rents, we'll talk about stochastic gradient descent, which is another key component about why neural networks are performing so well. And then next Tuesday, automatic differentiation, which is a sort of, remember we had that quote from Jan LeCun saying from all the way back in the 80s, oh, we just need software that allows us to build these things in flexible ways. It only took us 30 years to do. Um, okay, so last time I said that machine learning is based on a prediction function and an objective function. And in effect, what I'm gonna re review today is just particular choices of prediction function and objective function in order to get these ideas across. So what we're gonna look at is the quadratic loss. So that's the objective function, which you know, you'll have seen going all the way back to high school and linear systems, which you will have seen in some form going all the way back to um, high school. So the, the point I wanna start from is this, because just to get a sense of what we're actually trying to do, because when you, when you get taught about, say, loss functions, you don't get reminded about what the objective is. And there's this notion um, called uh, risk minimization. And this is uh, the so-called risk. So what this math is showing, and there, there's sort of more details about each of the things I'll talk about in the notes here, it's just these sort of highlights, as it were, is that we're interested in some loss, which is giving us a relationship between what our predictive model is saying um, and what the true data is saying. So the prediction model has some set of parameters W and the loss has within it the predictions and some uh, mismatch measure between the predictions and the ground true. But what we're interested in is that loss over this distribution. This is just important distribution. That's why it's got a fancy font. It's the sort of true distribution that generated these things in the first place, the world distribution like all possible images we might look at and all possible labels on those images. And when you look at an expected loss, what you're trying to say is I'm trying to sort of minimize this loss. And this is called the risk with respect to all things the world might throw at me. That's what I'd really like to do. Like just know if I could guarantee this loss was low, then on average, I would be guaranteeing that my performance would be good according to the objective function I've chosen. Of course, in practice, we don't get access to this distribution. This distribution is, you know, a result of the very, very complex, extremely rich world around us involving very many variables. So what we do, and we do this so habitually, we, we don't even normally talk about it, which is why I just wanted to sort of re-emphasize that, is we do a sample-based approximation to that. So the sample-based approximation says is, aha, I don't have access to that world distribution. But what I can, if I'm careful about how I acquire my data, I can say is I've got samples that are produced from that world distribution. So I can think of the images I see around me and the labels as coming from that world distribution. And then I can use a sample-based approximation to the integral. So instead of the integral itself, a sample-based approximation says, if I want P of Z, but I have samples from P of Z instead of P of Z itself, I can approximate P of Z in this way. And then what I end up with is the so-called empirical risk. So the empirical risk is the sample-based approximation to the risk. Now that's great, but it is also problematic because when you do almost all machine learning methods, and this is by the way, embedded in there is an IID assumption for those samples, right? So that's, coming out here, independent and identically distributed is what allows me to say this. If, if these were correlated samples, I couldn't, I'd have to restructure how I'm doing this. But when I look at that and I try and minimize that, I'm not minimizing the true risk. And this is what leads to problems because if I were minimizing the true risk, then I would sort of know that on average, my model is gonna perform well for future samples, 
Here I've taken a set of samples, it's an approximation, and I'm going to minimize that. So one of the things that can happen is I just push it into a place where the approximation is bad, right? Because there's no guarantee it remains a good approximation. And, and that's, that's the challenge of generalization, is making sure that doesn't happen, making sure that these approaches do stick close to that original approach. Any questions at that point? I'll just pause there. We should get more questions going. All good? Right, so let's look at some data. This is a favorite data set of mine. The history of this data set is I gave a talk in Uganda and in 2013, just after Stephen Kiprotich had won the Olympic marathon. So it was a data set that resonated with my audience. And then I've not bothered to update it. Um, so this is marathon data that if you've seen me talk before, you may have seen me give before. And I'm going to just use it as an example to show this sort of process in action because it's sort of a simple data set. It's got some years of Olympics along the bottom, and then it's got a pace. And the pace here is the winning uh, pace of the gold medal winner. So the reason it's pace instead of overall time is because up until I think, you know, just over 100 years ago, up until the London Olympics, I think, in 19, probably the first London Olympics. Uh, 1904 or something, the pace of the marathon or the length that may, must be later than that. The length of the marathon wasn't fixed. It was just over 40 kilometers. So that's why it's pace. And then what you see is like, we've got humans, the best human at the Olympics has got better at the marathon over time. And there's some interesting structure in the data, um, which I'm not gonna talk about too much today. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna fit some different models to this data to see these sort of processes around generalization in action. So we're gonna fit a polynomial basis to this data. Now, it's the nonlinear model in some sense, right? But I said we were gonna talk about linear models and that's really, really important. Linear models, when we say linear model, we mean linear in the parameters. This is something that like no one mentioned to me and took me ages to notice what was going on. Linear models can be nonlinear prediction functions, right? But they're linear in the parameters, okay? So that's really important. So when I say linear model, I don't just mean that you predict with a straight line. We're gonna use some curvy lines here. A linear model that predicts with a straight line does turn out to be linear in the parameters, but there are other models that are linear in parameters, um, but are uh, nonlinear in prediction function, yeah? So when we say linear model, we mean linear in the parameters. So what we're gonna do is fit the linear model with a polynomial basis to this marathon data and try different number of basis functions. So this is the sort of classic fit that um, you might've got when you sort of do things at high school. And what you are assuming is that there's two components to this one, which we think of as the intercept W zero, it's the point at which this line would go through the year zero. So if, I don't know, the people who were around at the time of uh, the birth of Christ had run the marathon. It's our estimate of how fast they would have run it. It's going to be a very poor estimate under this model. Um, and a gradient, which is sort of trying to estimate how much better we've got over time. Now notice that those parameters both have interpretations that we can think about those parameters and meaning things. And if we were statisticians, we would focus very much on that. In machine learning, we tend not to focus on that. We tend to focus on the prediction itself. Um, and that's one explanation as to why these parameterized models will get complicated very, very quickly because um, machine learning moved away from having models that could be interpreted in that way. Whereas statistics, for very, very good reasons, thinks a lot about that type of interpretation. When they do that, they always use beta for the parameters. And so I like to, if I'm worrying about the parameters, which sometimes I do, I use beta for them. If I'm not worrying about them, if they're just a thing that's helping me with predictions, I use W. And in this course, that's what we're gonna be doing. The parameters are a means to an end in terms of the predictions. We don't, they might be interpretable, but we're not setting them up to be interpretable or fitting the model in a way that guarantees they're interpretable. And that's an important philosophical difference between machine learning and statistics. So I've extended that model because th this original model wasn't very good. It sort of doesn't capture this sort of flattening. Um, you know, it's obviously going to extend to a, 
infinity at negative infinity, that's probably not reasonable, doesn't really fit what we might think about this data. And the way we can extend it is we can introduce more basis functions. So basis functions are just these things here. So in the linear model, the basis set is very simple. For each data, the basis set is one and X, right? So that's our basis set. Here, what we're doing is we're extending that. So that's X to the zero and X to the one. In a polynomial basis function, we're extending that to include X to the two. So this prediction, which I fitted to this data with a squared loss, now has an additional basis function and an additional weight on that basis function. And you can see actually now the interpretation starts to get a little bit harder in terms of what these things might mean. With polynomials, often there still is perhaps an interpretation. I can't quite think what it might be here, but it's, it's related to the curvature of the, um, of the surfaces at any rate, right? Because if we do a second derivative, we'd recover um, that basis. Well, that you've got to take into account. If you put a cubic term in, that will affect the curvature too. So um, now we put a cubic term in, and that's what means that instead of just sort of having a convex or concave function, it's got a point of inflection and it can do things like that. So we get more complexity by adding functions and simultaneously we're adding parameters. So that's quite nice. Which, of, which fit do you prefer so far? So I've, I've now gone to X to the nine. Which of those fits would you prefer so far? That one, cubic, yeah, I heard. Yeah, what, why don't we like that fit? That's presumably not gonna happen. That's, that's COVID, it predicted COVID. <laughs> uh, what, why actually polynomials are particularly bad? People use polynomials all the time because they're nice to introduce, but there's a particular thing about polynomials that's coming in. There's a few things I've done to make this fit even work in the first place. Can, can, can someone who's had any familiarity with these things know exactly what's going on here? What happens with polynomials that's causing these particularly weird behaviors? What happens for... Yeah, particularly for what type of numbers? Yeah, large magnitude. Yeah, no, high. It's not maths. <laughs> but also low, but negative low. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually the thing that I've done in order to make these fits work nicely is everything's rescaled on the input axis as well, right? Polynomials only behave nicely between minus one and one. So when you look at the code and the codes in the notes, you'll see what the first thing I do is rescale this, this, um, the span of the data to be between minus one and one. And that's quite an important trick very often in machine learning to rescale your data in any way, right? And, and that's why what you're seeing there is we're re leaving the bounds that I've scaled it to. So, so all of a sudden the magnitude is getting large. So in this case, the zero, because I've rescaled is somewhere around here and these numbers are getting large. So what tends to happen to the polynomials at that point is they go really high or really low because the, the largest term dominates. Speculating, that's, that's something that, so presumably, this is something I have not checked. So presumably if it's an odd polynomial, then we expect this type of behavior could happen because the largest term's dominating. Not guaranteed, but if it's an even polynomial, the largest term we wouldn't expect, we would expect convex or concave. That's, I'm sure that's not guaranteed because I'm just speculating there. So there's, lots, there's actually lots of different ways of trying to fix this. Bernstein, if you look in the polynomial literature, different bases for trying to fix this. But I'm not content with that. I think that's not good enough because so I'm going to go further and I'm going to try the 16th degree polynomial, which does, I'm, I'm pleased to see, fit that sort of speculation. <laughs> but, it seems uh, to fly positive. And so look, I'm getting a really good fit on this left-hand side now, look at that. But look how well I'm doing. So under the empirical risk, these fits are all getting better. But what's going on is the regions where we expect to have samples under the sort of uh, the true risk, we think that it's gonna be getting worse. Uh, I'm still not satisfied. 26th degree polynomial fit. This fit is actually quite hard to do well. You'll see the code in the notebook. You have to use QR decompositions because numerical problems come up precisely because of the reasons these bases sort of trying to cancel out these bases so they exactly fit everything through. And of course, I've chosen 26 degree polynomial because that's guaranteed to fit the data because there's 26 data points. 
Yeah. Now, in some ways, I don't like the term overfitting, but um, in this context, I quite like the term overfitting. It's sort of overfitting the data. It's a very loose term. I, I'm not actually you can see what the formal definition is. You'll hear it mentioned a lot, but that's the notion. That's like your classic overfit. The empirical risk is zero. The um, actual um, loss is uh, much higher if you look at the true risk under the world distribution because we expect in these intervening times, this is like Second World War, we don't quite expect that would have happened to marathon times in the Second World War. This behavior we see at the edges is exactly that problem we're getting to the edges are not stationary functions because they're polynomials. Okay, so um, let's try and, um, there's a really, really cool method that um, is so simple. And then there's entire books by a guy called Bradley Efron, who I think developed it in the first place on the theory of this method. But it's one of, it's like an absolutely cool, for, certainly for small data sets, it's a really interesting tool for doing machine learning. It's called the bootstrap. Who, who's heard of the bootstrap before? There we go, two. Yeah, so you see, no one, you get this far and no one teaches you anything. No. I think maybe why is it, it's so simple that it's kind of perhaps uh, maybe not taught as much. I think it's simple, but the maths to explain why it works is quite complicated. But um, I've, I've got this, I know this falls off the side here, but the code's in the, um, uh, in the notebook that I did check this morning should all be running on Colab. If you want to rerun this stuff. So what's the bootstrap? Well, we try and estimate that true risk with a special sampling trick. So we're given a data set. And then what we do is we say, I'm gonna estimate what performance is on this data set or what performance, well, I'm gonna try and do a new type, a different type of sampling where instead of fitting to the data I'm given, I'm gonna resample that data, right? So resampling that data with a particular characteristics with replacement. So if I've got 26 data points as I have here, I go through the data. So N is the shape of uh, that. I do in uh, NumPy a random choice, which is taking from those N and here I'm indexing by that. So I'm that's sampling with replacement because I'm not checking what my previous choices were, right? The first data point could appear three times. And in fact, when you think of Poisson statistics, that's what tends to happen. There's a Poisson statistics or binomial statistics it really is, right? Um, I do Poisson's like the infinite limit. Um, what happens is that you get certain points that are chosen lots of times and many points that are chosen zero or, or one times. So it's a resampling of your data set. And then you can, what you can do to try and measure these sort of risk things is, is fit to that. So well, that's what I've done here, bootstrap fits. And these are really cheap and fast ways. And like what all the theory is about why these error bars that we're now getting are potentially interesting. So it's a, it's a way which, in, so you've heard me speak before, you know, you, you'll hear me talk about Bayesian methods. This is non-Bayesian, but there's some really cool theory behind it. And all you're doing is you're just saying, I'm gonna bootstrap sample and fit as many models as I can afford. Now, if your fitting's quick, you can afford to fit many models. So 26 points, I can do as many as I like. And here I've probably done 10. Just to give you a sense of the variation in the parameters that's coming from those resamples. So it's telling me something about the uncertainty, but actually it's pretty consistent here. Most of these predictions are in line with each other. There's a slight variation, but the, I mean, as we'll see in a moment, compared to what can happen, the variation isn't, isn't that large. So this is now the cubic. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Look, one, one there is even, I mean, that must have dropped a number of these just out of by the by, as it were. Um, and we're starting to see some sort of spectrum of what we think the fits look like. So if you, once every so often, if you drop those, you get that. Of course, now, now this gets quite interesting, doesn't it? Because there's a part of me that quite likes these fits now in terms of, because they're giving this spectrum of things that can happen, right? So what's, so let's think a little bit about that. What's, what's wrong with that fit? Where if, if there are things we don't like about that fit or perhaps more extremely, what's wrong with this fit? It doesn't capture the data well enough. It's simpler than the data is, yeah. Um, that one. Does it or doesn't it capture the data well enough? I don't know. 
Um, maybe, maybe not. But what's quite interesting is these fits clearly have the power to capture the data well enough. But what they tend to do is they tend to overfit. Um, and what I'm building up to around this stuff is, is, is a sort of fundamental challenge in machine learning. So there's the, um, I can't go to 26 degree polynomial because the bootstrap fit, I'm not getting effectively 26 data points anymore, right? Because some points are resampled. So I can't go all the way up there. And in fact, occasionally the 16th dimensional polynomial is not gonna fit as well because you may effectively only have 15 data points because you may have dropped you know, 11 in theory. I'm not sure what the probability of that is. So I went up to some point where roughly I can do a fit and here's the 16th degree polynomial. I mean, okay, still some crazy things are happening, but the interesting thing here is it's sort of showing the, the span of the variance of the things that can happen. So the problem with um, these earlier models in some sense is that they don't do that. So they, they don't capture. This, even with the bootstrap, doesn't capture what can happen in the data. So if you were to fit these models and then make predictions, you know, even being aware your model was poor, it would basically, there would be things that definitely happen that you can't capture. We saw before when we do empirical risk minimization, then we get um, these sort of problems that we, we can overfit. But what's interesting with these sort of bootstrapping approaches, you can see that if you look at a number of that, if you were to average these things, that overfitting would uh, ease out. Who's heard of bagging as an approach? Bagging. What's bagging, Abby? <laughs> That's a great answer. I didn't say, can you remember what it is? <laughs> um, who, who, who's heard of it and remembers what it is? Max, you had your hand up. Do you remember what it was? Um, it's well, it actually involves bootstrapping. So the B stands for bootstrapping and the agging, aggregating, very good. Yeah, bootstrap aggregating. So in bagging, you aggregate your bootstraps. So you make your predictions by averaging or something. The simplest bagging would be to average. And it's very commonly done in uh, trees. So uh, bagged trees. And then, I mean, there's all sorts of sophisticated, very powerful methods that basically, so bootstrap sampling is a great way of doing, I, I don't work on trees at all, but it really is effective uh, in practice. Um, random forests, aren't they bagging in some way? Yeah. I mean, like, if you, if you don't want to know anything about your data, if you're going to ignore everything that I might say about it, try a random forest first, I guess, is the, is the sort of thing that you should do. Don't try a neural network before you've tried a random forest. They're, they're doing classification trees and bootstrap aggregating them in order to deal with potential overfitting. It deals with that. Um, but the thing that I wanted to sort of introduce you here is the fundamental object of what's going on here, which is most beautifully expressed. It happens across different... Uh, objective functions, but it's just really easy to decompose with the squared objective function. It's called the bias variance decomposition. And the bias variance decomposition takes this error and basically decomposes it into those two terms. Part of your error is coming because your model can't capture what happens in the world. And part of your error is coming because you don't have sufficient data to define the parameters of your model. Like that thing that we were seeing with the, so you saw that with the, with the bootstrap, for the simple models, the variation in the model fit wasn't great, right? But for the complex models, the variation in the model fit gets quite great. And that variation in the model fit turns out to be a term in this error. So it's in the notes, we're not gonna go through it in detail, but if we look at the, ri the, um, the risk, and since it's a squared function, what we do is we, we decompose it into two terms. One is known as the bias or it's the bias squared which is associated, which is like, you know, if we looked at this model um, and we gave it all the data in the world, it would still not fit the data because it's too simple, right? Now you can increase the complexity of your model to get around that. So you can reduce bias by going for more and more complex models. But then you get this problem of, I don't have enough data to understand what the parameters of my model can be. And that gives you the variance term. And then finally, there's a third term, which is the irreducible error. So the irreducible error is this sort of like, well, there's noise in the system, right? Let's not go into what that means or what noise is or anything else. In some sense, it's, you could just say, well, it's variance. To me, it kind of feels like noise is just variance that I'm not caring about. But um, yeah, the irreducible error. Right, or bias that I'm not caring about, which is it? 
I said I wasn't going to go into it. I went into it and I've confused things. Um, three components then, bias, variance, and irreducible error, the sort of noise. So you can't, you won't generalize beyond the noise level in the data. So one is due to having a model that's too simple. One is due to have a model that's too complex. And one is something you can't do anything about. So there's a sort of Goldilocks effect going on here, right? Um, it's annoying in the Goldilocks effect that it's, it's, you know, I always think of baby bear as the smallest mommy bear and daddy bear as the largest, but when it comes out to which porridge um, Goldilocks eats, it's the baby bear, it's the smallest one. So in some sense, Goldilocks goes for bias error or something, I don't know. Um, but there's, there's some sort of Goldilocks effect in there, even if the ordering of, bear, of bears isn't quite right. So. Error due to bias is coming from a model that's too simple, and error due to variance is coming. This is important, not from a model that is too complex. People say that all the time, and it's a sloppy thing to say. It's rare that the model is more complex than the world it's trying to model, right? That happens only for simulated data. The world is really, really, really complex, right? So it's quite hard for you to imagine models that are more complex than that. Variance is coming from you not having enough data to parameterize that model, to fit that model, right? So when you try and come to fit it, you tend to get problems in uh, the, with the empirical risk minimization, right? So it's insufficient data is the problem, not over complexity. I like to emphasize that. Most people would just say it's an overly complex model. Um, and then in practice, um, we, we tend to do regularization to solve this. So, You'll see this. So I'm talking now in the classical sense, right? This is what we kind of would have all done up until 2012, or most of us. This would be your classic view of generalization. How do we solve this in general? Well, in the notes, you'll see we end up solving these things through linear systems, where the linear system is of the form um, uh, sort of AX equals B. But B has this particular form. A has this matrix form. So this is known as a design matrix. Uh, phi, and it's the matrix of all those vectors, x and one, uh, or x squared, x and one, or x cubed. It's a matrix that has each of those vectors for every data point on a line. And then if you take the uh, sort of transpose of that matrix, multiply it by itself, you get a matrix A in terms of if we're solving the system AX equals B for W is X, and B is that same matrix weighted, the rows of it weighted by Y. That's your classic linear system solution. You'll see it in the notes, how to do it. It turns out to be ill-posed, right? So I, how much numerical computing you've all done, I don't know, but solving systems like this can be problematic um, if there's sort of linear, if these, the rows of this matrix aren't linearly independent, people that resonate with people. So what happens is if you, um, when you start getting these large basis functions, or if you're starting to get a number of basis functions approaching the number of data, this problem becomes ill-posed. The rows of this thing become linearly uh, dependent and you can't solve it. Um, simultaneously, it turns out, well, the way we, we, we solve that is we, we regularize. So, very, very often you'll see things like this being mentioned in the classical literature. So here I've written in vector form, the least squares objective. So this is y the target minus f the prediction function. The inner product between these two is just giving me the sum of y minus f squared, right? It's just my way of writing it, the details of how I get there again in the notes. Um, that's normally the thing we're trying to minimize. F is a function of W, so it's a prediction function. But what happens if we regularize is we say something additional. We say something like, oh, and try and keep the coefficients small. The notion being if those coefficients are small, things are likely to wiggle less somehow, right? So this is the weighting coefficients around the polynomial. And this is your classic, this is known as chicken off regularization. It's as old as the hills. Um, that what you try and do to try and stop it wiggling around too much is you would add this regularization term. Um, ah, sorry, so I thought I had the equation in there. Okay, it's in the notes. And what that has the effect of, ah, no board in this place. There was at least a board next door. That has the effect in this previous, see this, this term here, 
what I'm calling the Hessian, which is the curvature of this system that has the effect of substituting this one with that term. And now that is a really cool trick because not only does it give you um, better fits because it keeps these parameters small, it also gives you a more numerically stable system because when you're adding, so this matrix here, if I add a diagonal to it, so this is like the regularization coefficient alpha and I'm adding a diagonal to it, it makes sure it's full rank, right? So it means that those columns are linearly independent and the larger alpha, the sort of stronger that effect is. Obviously I can make alpha infinity and it's just a diagonal matrix. Diagonal matrices, that would be a trivial to solve system if that's a diagonal matrix. So what I'm doing, it turns out when I add that in, is I'm making this system more stable. And that's your classic, how I solve these systems. I come up with a prediction function, an objective function. I'm careful with linear algebra. Um, I end up regularizing to try and um, either deal with it numerically. That's also very confusing because in numerical methods, regularizing is about dealing with numerical problems, but in machine learning, regularization is about trying to make sure your empirical risk stays close to the true risk, okay? So that's just sort of my whirlwind tour of the classic theory. Now, what did we do? Remember last time I sort of said, okay, there was this cool meeting that I went to at the Newton Institute, it was 1997. I showed you the pictures of the people that were there, Karina Cortez, Isabel, actually Karina Cortez and Isabel Guillaume weren't there, but uh, Vladimir Vatnik was there. And I said that that moment things changed in that we stopped using neural networks. What did we start doing? Well, because of problems of regularization, uh, problems of neural network overfitting or the fear of neural network overfitting, we really shifted to look on well-regularized systems. So this linear system I've just shown you is foundational. It's really got all sorts of complicated things, non-linear models underneath it, leading to things like support vector machines, Gaussian processes, which all implicitly are linear models with very sophisticated forms of regularizations. So you'll see in the world of fitting, people talking about things like fitting with splines, uh, Hilbert spaces, mapping things into Hilbert spaces. All of these turn out to be really interesting ways of performing this regularization that ensure generalization works well. And we were so into that. Lots of cool maths for like, best part of a decade, I think, we were doing that sort of thing to do these classification fits. And one reason people weren't interested in neural networks was because we knew that they didn't have these properties that we were talking about. We knew that they were going to overfit because they did not have these type of elegant regularization terms popping in here, that this is the foundational. So what happened? Well, we thought we knew, but there's all sorts of other interesting things you can do to try and regularize these systems. So one of them is known as dropout. That's quite famous approach people are using in neural networks, um, but it's very closely related to something else people uh, used to do in early neural network days, which is so-called training with noise. So they used to give patterns to the neural network and they used to say, well, but the neural network, it needs to have a noisy version of a pattern. So you'll add noise to the pattern before you train the neural network. And that turned out to improve generalization forms. Lots of sort of interesting heuristics. Um, now, sometimes those interesting heuristics have quite elegant interpretation. So training with noise turns out to be equivalent with Tikhonov regularization under certain conditions, that thing I showed you before. And also some of these things have interpretations of other sophisticated methods we do like ensemble methods or Bayesian. So ensemble methods is like bagging, fit a load of models and average them. Right? So some of these things have uh, approaches like that. But there's something really interesting and fundamentally new really going on with, um, with these neural networks. So these neural network systems are highly overparameterized because what happens instead of having one linear layer like we had in the um, uh, linear system, we feed one of those models into another. So what you end up with is a neural network, a fully connected neural network. You end up, it's like you sort of go through that linear process once, but you don't stop there. You keep feeding it into another nonlinearity. And every time you do that, you introduce a, high, a set of parameters. So these models have billions or trillions of parameters and they're fitted to data that isn't necessarily that large. So they're in that zone, like the 26 degree polynomial. 
which was one reason people were unwilling to sort of fit them. So the thing that you're going to do in your practical is explore what goes on. It turns out that when we're fitting neural networks, the regularization, regularization is occurring. It must be occurring in some form because these models are extremely powerful. They can definitely overfit. People do experiments to show that the models overfit, right? So you follow the algorithms, you set up the labels in a particular way, you can make the model overfit. But in general, they don't tend to overfit. And that's kind of the new, the understanding of what's going on, uh, which you're going to explore in the um, first assignment. So there's not enough regularization in these objective functions to explain what's going on. They're not using traditional generalization approaches. Um, and what that implies, which is really, really interesting, and I haven't talked about at all how we're going to do that because Ferenc is going to start talking about that next time, is the generalization properties of these things is coming through the algorithm. Now, when I showed you the linear system solution, which would be the classic way that you learn how to fit a linear system, right? That's an algorithm in a sense, right? It doesn't feel like an algorithm because it's just a bit of maths. We can solve it analytically. We can solve the system analytically. But in order to do that solution, to solve that linear system, your computer is having to do an algorithm like Gauss-Jordan elimination. You're just calling it as a package inside somewhere or Kolesky decomposition or LU. In fact, it should be doing a QR decomposition as you see in the notes if it's doing it correctly, most numerically stable. Different algorithms have different properties. Now the algorithm in a neural network is to do gradient descent from an initial starting point. And it's quite hard because you can't sort of do the analysis analytically of what that's gonna do for all situations. People are trying to work on that a lot. But it's something to do with the way we're implementing that algorithm with this prediction function that ensures we're not getting those overfitting solutions. And you're going to see that in uh, the assignment. So this is kind of what's going on. So this was our classical view. And this is a slide from a paper. And I've given you the um, paper to look at as part of your uh, assignment um, that is about this phenomenon known as double descent. Um, now, this double descent phenomenon, this is the classic point of view that we have in this region underfitting or high bias. So this is the linear model. We have in this region overfitting or high variance. So that's the sort of 26 degree polynomial. And the sense is the capacity of the model, some measure of how complex this model is, counter parameters or whatever, is along this x axis here. And as we increase the capacity of the model, the notion is traditionally there's a sweet spot called the bias variance dilemma, trying to find that sweet spot. What's the right capacity that you should fit the model, which looked a bit like the cubic in that data we saw before, who knows? We didn't explore it exhaustively, but it looked like the cubic might be a good, good fit. Um, and then what we expect to happen is that the, so the training risk is the empirical risk, and, but the test risk is our, you know, on unseen data. So that's the sort of the true risk. So the training risk goes down to zero, but the test risk, goes up because we're overfitting because we're starting to see variance. Now the double descent phenomenon, and this paper is about linear models. So this applies not just to neural networks. It also applies to standard linear models is what happens if you're really stupid and you say, well, I'm going to increase capacity even more. Well, we didn't really look because that seemed pretty dumb given we'd already got to this bad point, but the double descent phenomenon is this that as you increase the capacity of the model, the generalization performance gets better. And where we're operating now is over here. And there's really interesting things going on. Number one, this, this point here is quite hard to find. You'll see in the notes, you have to use QR decomposition, really numerically stable algorithms, be very careful to find this point where the error is really high. Remember it was going all the way through the points like that. But the interpolation, so they call it, uh, Misha calls it the interpolation threshold. It's Misha Belkin, uh, one of the authors on the paper. I, I refer to him not because necessarily he's the most important author, just because I know him. Um, so I think of the paper, I think of him saying it, even if he didn't say it originally. Um, so this is the so-called interpolation threshold, the point at which the model is capable of explaining the training data exactly. And yes, that's our polynomial fit. But what's sort of happening in um, uh, 
neural networks is as we're parameterizing more and more and more, we're finding that the generalization gets better. And that is a new thought. And we don't actually have, I mean, we've got lots of ideas about why it happens when it happens, but I would say the rigorous theory isn't there I'm seeing if Ferenc sort of vaguely nods, but, but you can narrow it down so that we expect things, it must be something to do with the algorithm, even if not 100% to do with the algorithm. So what you'll see if you look in the literature nowadays, you'll see a number of different papers trying to look at this phenomenon. I'm not saying you need to rush off and read all these papers or deeply understand them because the challenge when you're trying to do theory on such a complex thing, because this complex thing is what Ferenc will explain next time, doing stochastic gradient descent on these models, is that, that you know, like a lot of simple algorithms, the algorithm's simple, the theory is extremely complex. That previous stuff I told you about, all the regularization stuff, the maths is simple, but the algorithms were very complex, right? To make sure you were conforming to the maths. This is, I don't, this, this feels like there's this weird fundamental tension. Well, apparently I'm doing a lecture 51 minutes ago. It's helpful with my calendar. Uh, so what we're really interested in now is, oh, so in the neural tangent kernel, so what did that look like? So the neural tangent kernel work is trying to look at these regularization theories and combine what we used to look at in terms of regularization theory with the notion of what's going on in a neural network algorithm and trying to align the two to explain generalization. Um, it's definitely interesting. I don't think it explains everything that's going on because it comes back with a kernel function and neural networks are more, more interesting to me than just kernel functions. So I, I think it's cool work, but I don't think it's a full explanation of what's going on. There's lots of work on regularization and optimization that by looking at when you're optimizing these models, that there's some implicit regularization going on, given your starting point and the way you're choosing to optimize. And the sort of papers in this space do things like they treat the system, uh, they treat the optimization process as a differential equation. And then they say, oh, I, I'm going to try and solve this differential equation and show that the solution I arrive at is going to be a well-regularized place. That's the sort of work that these papers do. And there's really cool papers on that. Again, a lot of them are for linear models. So they're giving us an instinct about what's going on. They're not telling us right, naturally what's going on in the most sophisticated deep networks. I do really like this paper which is the so-called deep linear model, which really highlights some of the things that are going on. So a deep linear model is one where, so this is a linear model because this is your input and this is a matrix multiplying by your input. If we covered up, so if we, if we substituted W for a product of all these matrices, W is a multiplication of four different matrices. It's still a matrix, right? So you can put W back in here and it's a linear model, right? X could be a set of basis functions to make it, a non-linear prediction, but it's still linear in the parameters. But then this, these papers on deep linear models, they studied what happens if you just reparameterize your linear model with four different matrices and how it affects the type of solutions you find, for example, in these highly overparameterized spaces. And it has a significant effect of the, on, the, on what the solution is. In particular, it tends to make the final solution low rank. And low rank is another way of regularizing, it turns out. So there's some really, really interesting things going on, a variety of different ones. For Rents, I think we'll talk about it more on Thursday in terms of the way it comes up with stochastic gradient descent and give you sort of more hints um, that are beyond the way we used to think about generalization 10 to 15 years ago. So when you look at the literature, you'll see a lot of work on that space. I would say, I don't think, any of us, unless the news has changed, think that there's one paper that explains everything. What we see is a lot of papers pointing in a particular direction or, or exploring how algorithms work. Um, and they're quite technically sophisticated. And, and not you know, even the most technically sophisticated of these papers, say the neural tangent kernel and, and, and derived methods, are not working with the type of neural networks that people actually train, right? Because that's even, even harder. But they're starting to get us to understand why the way we thought about regularization was, was um, not wrong because it's right to the extent it goes. It just doesn't cover this really important new regime. And that's one of the reasons you're seeing such an explosion of interest in these methods. Having said all that, by the way, 
In the low data regime, I don't think much of this helps at all. Ferenc might disagree or agree, but my sense is if you've got 100 data points, you might as well forget everything I've just said and focus on the regularization regime we were talking about at the beginning. And everyone keeps making that mistake, fitting a deep neural network for 100 data points and expecting it. No, all these things are happening with very large data sets and very, very big models. So that's the regime where this new interesting space is. I'll stop there just to see if there are any questions. I'm going to stop the video as well in case. Uh, stop the video. <laughs>